program. I'm just from our other side, the Greenwood, and I'm just uh, blessed to be with you today. So before I start with my sermon, I just want to open in prayer. Lord um, Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, oh Lord. Thank you for everything that you have done in our lives and that you continue to do, Lord. Um, I pray that you uh, be with us all, oh Lord, as I deliver your word, oh Lord. I pray that um, only your words will come from my mouth, oh Lord, and that um, we will be, all be open to receiving what you have to say today, oh Lord. Um, so I pray in Jesus' mighty name, amen. All right. So... For my um, sermon today, we're I'm going to be, uh, what I titled it is called Authority Under Heaven. All right. And then, so I'll be going through exactly what I'm talking about with this Authority Under Heaven. And um, it's something I came upon when I was, so I'm doing summer class, right? So um, it's not actually. I'm inspired by obviously the Bible and a book that I'm reading um, by Charles Craft and it's, it's called I Give You Authority Practicing the Authority Jesus Gave Us and so it goes in depth into what this really means the authority that Jesus gave us and before I go into that I will I have a few points that um, I will go through so we will see what exactly is this authority and as when you look through the Bible, you see that in Jesus' ministry here on earth, really short, it was only about like three years that he came. And he did ma many miracles, many miraculous things during this time. And you can see the great power and authority that Jesus Christ had. Um, and later on, you will see that that same great power and authority that Jesus Christ had you can also see in what the apostles did when he commissioned them out. And even further, there was another group of 72 that he sent out in pairs that had the same um, authority and power as Jesus Christ. But it's obviously not their own, but through um, the Holy Spirit that has been given to them. And I'll, I'll go through that um, as we go through the sermon today. So authority under heaven. So I broke it down into um, three points. Um, but before I go into three points, I will tell you about the the Greek words that they actually use to describe this Greek authority, or not Greek authority, the authority. As we know that the New Testament was written in Greek, right? So when we look at it, whenever you look at the passages that has power or authority, the two words that are used are those two up there. And I might butcher the pronunciation because I'm not Greek, but <laughs> um, I looked it up and you know how they break down the words. So for my understanding of how they broke down the word, um, the first one is um, exclusia, and the other one is um, uh, dynamis. All right, so when we look at it, we'll I'll first go to power, and that is um, dynamis, and then I'll read you the definition that is given me. So, this is the normal word for power, for might, strength, or force, and is also used as a parallel meaning to miracles. And I forgot I have it up here. Um, and so, here we see it's the power of God and Jesus Christ and earthly powers over rulers, enemies, and weather. So it's actually the power element of what authority is. And then there's another element that we'll look at, and it's exousia. So this is often referred to power, but this time it's the focus on the actual right to use power rather than the power itself. So you can see that there's two parts that even though we use one word, authority and power, or two words actually, authority and power, is, so what we're talking about here is the authority that God had, or that Jesus Christ had. And he had the actual power to do the things that he did, um, and the authority, so the right given to him to actually do these things. And 
um, we can see that this, the same power and authority is given to the uh, apostles, which will uh, be later going through. And so it was given through, it can be given through personal right or brought on by status and delegation. It can be under legal, social, political, moral domains in the spiritual and in the natural world. Um, so both these elements are seen in the work of Jesus Christ. And in the book I was reading, the author, um, Charles Kraft, he said this, um, Jesus received power from the Holy Spirit and his authority from maintaining his intimacy um, with the Father. So he wasn't alone in this, right? Um, you see, the power came from the Holy Spirit and then to maintain it, he kept that intimacy with his Father. And at the end of the ministry, we see that the Holy Spirit too filled um, the apostles. And he advised these apostles to stay close to him. And there's important reason why um, he told them that. And so, uh, to break down my sermon, I put it to three points. So, not to know what this power source is, because it's not only Jesus here, but I'm talking, because we're talking about the spiritual and the natural realm. And a lot of people don't believe in the spiritual realm, but we do. So we gotta know what our spirit, our power source is first, where it's coming from. And then obedience is key to this authority um, that is held. And then how do we, or exercising that power and authority that has been given onto us. So we'll go through the first one, knowing your power source. So Jesus advised his, or told his disciples to keep close to them. Um, as we know that obedience is such a big part in this, uh, in authority. And it's not only us that need to obey, but Jesus Christ also needed to. He always communed with his father um, while he was here on earth. And um, so we saw in his ministry that he worked in the natural and the spiritual realm. And um, nowadays people, they don't, they don't think that the spiritual realm actually exists. Because when, when I was reading my book, I was like, and my coworker asked me, she's like, oh, what are you reading? You know, <laughs> I was like, well, um, I showed her what it was, but like, I was like, how, how would I even try to explain or would you even grasp the concept of this? Because people, they don't see it anymore. They're like, oh no, it's nothing. Or if they believe in spiritual things, they believe in ghosts or some, some type of monsters that I don't even know what to explain, but they believe other things that were not coming from either God or Satan himself. And so, it's because it people are becoming more easily deceived if you don't think that there's another power source out there. And if, if it's not coming from God, then where is it coming from? You know, um, and so being blind to that idea, um, people are more receptive into not seeing that there is something else out there. And if you don't believe there's something else out there, then it's really hard to justify that there is a spiritual realm. Um, because we see that their eyes have already been shut to that idea. So, but for us here, we know that there is a spiritual realm. So. We have to make sure that we are plugged into the right source and who is God our Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, right? Um, the Trinity three in one. And so uh, in uh, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, it states, in their case, the God of the world has blinded the minds of unbelievers and to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. And if you're not connected to God, then What's going on here? And so, to see, to bring about this connection, 
um, we have the story of the vine and the branches. And in John 15, I picked up verse 5. And in verse 5, it says, I am the vine, and you are the branches. If you remain in me, and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And so, it is evident here that God's people are connected to him. And here, the metaphor that they use is that he's the vine and we're the branches. You cannot grow if you're not attached, right? And here, people are able to bear fruit only when they are attached. Because we know, as we go through the rest of it, that those that aren't bear fruit, they get cut off, right? But the ones that remain, they will flourish and they will grow. And in verse um, 15 and 16, it says, I no longer call you servants because the servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I call you friends. For everything I have learned from my father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you may go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so, that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. So when we look at it, uh, look at the verse here, where he's calling us, you're no longer servants of mine. And he's calling us actual friends. And when I read this, I'm like, oh man, he's so touching, you know? <laughs> he doesn't see us in, a, in the status that we actually belong. You know, after our fallenness, Jesus, came to redeem us, and he gave us that same authority that he had, which is totally mind-blowing to me when I um, read all of this, that he would actually entrust all this to us. But um, you see here, he chose us. He's the one who appointed us. And if, um, you know, when we remain in him, we'll make fruits that will last. And if we ask for anything in his name, only his name, then he will give it to us. And so we were specifically chosen by God for a purpose. And this is such a crazy, like, privileged relationship that we have with Christ. And if only we remain in that communion with God that we can have those fruit. But you know, devil's a great deceiver. He is able to trick many people into thinking other things. And he has used the he has used authority under many people um, to sway the minds of others. And you know how Jesus used his authority to pursue good things because he wanted the earth to be redeemed back to him. That, that's why he came back, right? But Satan, on the other hand, has other agendas. He wants the total opposite of what Jesus wants. And people are deceived because Satan presents things to us that seem good. And so he'll give you, you have like that same, it looks like the same authority and power, but the results are quite different. Um, so he's used people, movements, and many other things to create havoc on this world. And so that's why it's so important that we have authority figures that have the authority of office to actually pursue things under God. Because when they're not under God, they go south, totally different. And same with uh, movements that have been um, created, something in um, our time, in the North American time, that's really big right now is the, I don't know if you've heard, the New Age Movement. And so, when I looked it up, I was like, what is the definition of the New Age Movement? And so, here, theologically, it's um, the movement typically adopts a belief in a holistic form of divinity. So, it imbues all of um, the universe, so including the human beings itself. And there's a strong emphasis on the spiritual authority of yourself. Um, so 
so, but we don't have power. Now, that's not where it comes from. We're not plugged into ourselves, we're plugged into God. But over here with this new age movement, part of the authority is yourself. And um, in class, my teacher gave an example. Um, so my teacher is a pastor for one of the churches, a really big church. And uh, he was talking about one of the youth in his church. And this girl is a Christian, but her family is not. And so her mom is really, really into the New Age movement right now. And so she, I'm not sure exactly what she did to her home, but I think she has like a garden dedicated to whatever their principles are. And so whenever she's at home, she feels actually spiritually drained because of all the elements that are in her home that are not uh, pertaining to God. And she's like, what am I going to do? This is my mom. I love my mom. And I, want, I can't leave. I'm a student. Um, but I feel spiritually drained at home. And so she talked to the people at church. And well, the advisor was like, well, you can't leave your mom because you don't have the money to do any of that stuff. But he, they told her that, like, do you have your own room? Yes, she had her own room. And she was like, well, that can be your dedicated place where you can have solace in your house. So what she ended up doing was she ended up praying in her room and um, she pretty much declared that like, see all the influences outside that her mother is bringing in cannot enter this area. And she dedicated her room to God because that's her only place in there. And so after that, whenever she's in that room, that's, that's her solace. That's where she can be at peace with God and not be influenced by the other things in her house. And I thought that was, that was actually really cool because in this class I've learned a lot and um, about the authority that we actually hold. And um, sometimes we only think that other, there's only like maybe the big Christians out there who can cast out demons, who have authority, over um, this thing, but no, um, we also do. Because we have been employed by the same spirit that employed, um, you say, our big name Christians out there and the disciples and Jesus Christ himself. So, but before we actually employ this authority, we have to make sure that we are being obedient. And so knowing your actual power source, we have to be obedient to this power source, which is Jesus Christ. And so the authority given to us by God is not to be just used for anything. And the power authority should be used to glorify him who gave it to us. Uh, but you see, many people misuse it. They don't know what it's for. They're, people get power hungry or people use verses in the Bible to skew things. Um, people have used the verses how um, the wife is supposed to submit to their husband to actually uh, justify why they can abuse their wives. We say, like, oh, wife is supposed to submit to me. So here, theologically wrong, that that's not how we're supposed to do things. And others, you know, they, they use their power and authority in, let's say, the political office to do wrong things. We've seen um, many things go wrong. But in Jesus Christ's case and his disciples and whatnot, they use their authority for good, for the glory of the kingdom of God. You see, they cast out demons, they were healing the sick, um, and everything that happened for them, they were using it to praise God. And so that way of it, using your authority is the appropriate way versus other ways um, that people have done. So when we look at a story, um, I will we'll look at Jonah. And here in the book it pointed out that God's work can be done when people work um, and obey God. Um, so, in the story, 
first, we know that Jonah didn't want to obey God. Um, here, it says that the word of God came to Jonah, son of Ante, um, to go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away and the, uh, from the Lord and headed for Turkish. So here, you can see that Jonah's not obeying. God gave him the authority to go over there and talk to the people, but Jonah's like, no, oh, no, I don't wanna go. I'm going the other way. And uh, we can see this in ourselves all the time. Um, I, I, per se, I, when I was like, oh, if you were to ever um, say which character you are, I was like, oh, I think I'm like a Jonah. Because um, God was like, yeah, I, you should go to Tyndale, go to Tyndale for school, which is the seminary that I go to right now for my master's. And I was like, nope, nope. I'm going another way. I don't want to go. And um, this is what Jonah did. He ran from God, but he can't run very far. <laughs> Which is what he learned. And eventually, uh, Jonah gave in and obeyed the Father. Which is in Jonah 3. And says, this is when he actually went to the king of Nineveh after all the hardships that he went through for not listening. <laughs> He said, when Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, took off his robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. And this is the proclamation he issued to Nineveh. So you see here, Jonah didn't have to do much explaining here. He just warned the king, okay? And he's like, by decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flock, taste anything, do not let them eat or drink, um, but let the people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God, which is Jonah's God this time, and let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and have compassion, turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. So you see here in the story, he just went over and he talked to the king. He went over there with the authority that God had given him to go and talk to the king. That's all he did. Um, when sometimes um, we think that, it's like, oh no, I, have, I don't have the power and authority to do anything. Well, you have to remember that it's Jesus Christ who employed you. And in the book, Kraft said, through human allegiance and obedience to one another, to one or the other, um, God or Satan gains the greater authority to work in human affairs. So in Jonah's case, God was able to do great, th great things through Jonah. But it was only possible for him to do this if Jonah allowed him. If he didn't allow him, then probably God would have found somebody else. But Jonah's heart softened a little, and he <laughs> decided to go. So if he didn't do this, who knows? There's Satan is working so hard against um, Jonah, because he doesn't want Jonah to go over there. He doesn't want those people to proclaim God. He wants them to do the things, the evil ways that they're uh, have been living and this is defeat for him so he's working double time so it's like Jonah's not going he's not going but we know that God is the one who always prepares because if it's not here at this time then it'll be um, um, at the end because we know that you know there's there's a battle going on and seen or unseen there um, because some people have the gift of discernment, which they can see um, things that other people can't see in the spiritual uh, realm. But even if you can't see it, it's actually going on. And I don't even know why the devil tries, but he does, and he tries really hard. But we know that he is ultimately defeated, and 
but he is still doing his work. It's pure evil, and just really sad that this is the position that he chose, and that many people are choosing. They're choosing to live under the authority of the devil versus the authority of Jesus Christ. Um, but we can see here in Revelation 21:4 that in the end, when the new earth has come, um, there will be no more death, no mourning, or crying, or even pain, for um, the old order of things has passed. So everything that the devil is working for will be at end, because he's basically going to lose. But while he still has time, he's honing in as much force as he can. And he is deceiving Christians into thinking that they, they don't have the same power and authority that Jesus Christ had. But that's not the case. Um, we have that same power and authority because of the Holy Spirit that has been sent to us. So my last point is exercising the authority that has been given. The source of Christ's power was from the infilling of the Holy Spirit. So we see that Jesus Christ was baptized by John the Baptist, and the Holy Spirit descended onto him, and he was filled. During the Great Commission, um, this is what he says to his disciples. So this is in Matthew 28, 18 to 20. Um, but in this one, when Jesus had called the twelve, he gave them power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases, and he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And in Acts 2 4, it says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak in tongues as the Spirit had enabled them. So the same Spirit that descended onto Jesus Christ as a dove when he was baptized, was um, instilled in the apostles themselves. And this time he was seen in the form of a tongue of fire. And even before that, like in this, um, in this verse, this is before the, um, the tongues of fire had come down on them. But here, when they were doing his ministry before um, the whole for the resurrection of Christ, he gave them power authority already. But when he was saying, I'm going to leave, he didn't leave them alone. He uh, um, gave them the power under him, which was given through the Holy Spirit. So here, Matthew 28, 20, um, 18 to 20 says, And Jesus came to them and said, All the authority under heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, I am uh, with you always to the end of time. So we see here, all authority under heaven and on earth was given to Jesus. And then he sent them out. And if we're thinking, oh no, only Jesus and the apostles had this power, I was like, well, no, um, not if that was not only the case, because there was another group, and these were not the original twelve. And in this one, in Luke ten seventeen to twenty, it says, and the seventy two returned with joy, because they had been commissioned by um, um, God to go, and He says. This is what they said to him. Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. Keyword, in your name. And he says, he, uh, he replied, I saw Satan fall from lightning from heaven. I have given you the authority to trample over snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your name is written in heaven. And you see here that they're, they're shocked. They were so surprised. They were like, oh my goodness, we're doing things that you were able to do. And if I was these people, I'd be extremely shocked um, that I 
and I would be able to do the things that um, Jesus did. But it's when you let God's authority reign in you and when you actually obey in, in faith that you can do this, he can do great things in you. And the same authority that was given to Jesus, the original 12, and then in the story to the 72 that um, went out of pair, they had the same authority. And when we see here in the verse, it says the snakes and scorpions um, won't even harm them. Because in that time, for the preachers, what was um, a physical threat to them was the actual snakes and scorpions. Because they would, you know, go and physically harm them. But it's also symbolic. Um, because snakes and scorpions were a symbol for um, demonic oppression. Or, um, but you see here that he said that nothing will harm you. Nothing will harm you. And that was um, his promise to these people. And in the book that I'm reading that by Charles Craft, he says that that same authority that has been passed on by these people through the Holy Spirit is now in his Christians. Because we're, the apostles are not alive anymore. Um, those people, those 72, are not alive anymore. We are. We're the Christians of today. And we have that same power, that Holy Spirit, or hold the Holy Spirit that implored them. And when I was doing my research, I came upon this article that talked about um, Dunamis and Exclusia. And it says, it is through the power of Dunamis, of the Holy Spirit, that men through the indwelling of exousia, so this is the authority, um, calls upon the Holy Spirit's dunamis, because it's not ours, um, so that we can actually do these things um, that uh, the apostles and other people in faith before us have done. But it's only through faith and in our obedience to God that we're allowed to do these things. Because, like I told you before, people have misused it. And see, that doesn't bring out the work of God. Because it, all he does is the work of good. And so we must be in obedience with God. And we must know what he wants us to do in that time. So we're always communing with him. And when we think of the vine and the branch, we're always attached to him. We're always attached to that power source so that we're not straight away and use that power and authority that we have for other things other than his kingdom. And so when I think about it, the power and authority that's given to us Christians because of the Holy Spirit. Um, and sometimes we think of ourselves as being so small. You know, so, so I was thinking, I was like, when I was writing the sermon, I was like, okay, so what, is, what does this really mean? You know, what what is the identity that I have in God because of this? It was like I was thinking, I was like, well, I'm just, you know, Elisa Penalosa who was born in Montreal and a student and currently living in Scarborough, you know, um, and in school. But when I look at this and the power that's employed through us through the Holy Spirit, I was like, no, Elisa, you, you can do more than that. He's like, you are like Spanelosa, who is a child of God. And since you have accepted God as your personal Lord and Savior, you are employed by the same Holy Spirit that employed all the Christians before us, who was in Jesus Christ and the apostles, who were able to do miraculous things for God. And you have that same gifting and ability. You just, you just have to obey. You have to obey God. And so, the authority under heaven. Always know what the power source that you're holding is, what's behind you. Um, obedience is key. And so, exercise that authority that God has given you. And don't let it go to waste. Because we know that the powers of Satan are under work. And if, he, if you allow him, 
to deceive you and to think that you don't have the same authority um, that Jesus Christ had, then a lot of his work will prevail. But we don't want that. We know that God is the one who will ultimately prevail. But we're the instruments that help um, bring this about. So yeah. Amen.